um, uh, John is an independent consultant. Um, his training is in public health microbiology. And um, he's been involved with the Pool and Water Treatment <coughs> Advisory Group um, and also uh, the Health Protection Agency, um, the public health program in England. Um, he has uh, over 30 years of, of, of experience, really, in detection survival and control of pathogenic microorganisms in the environment, particularly water and air. And he's been involved in 70 outbreaks of uh, leg uh, primarily Legionnaire's disease. And so he has a lot of experience in that regard. Um, he's uh, um, also uh, been involved in this issue of control and control of Legionella growth in water systems. Um, he's been involved in the ISO methods, so he has a lot of experience both in outbreak monitoring and development of these methods. And um, he's advised the UK Health and Safety um, Executive in the Health Department um, and, and has been involved in WHO. So we've got experience here in, in cooling towers industry methods. So John, I'm going to uh, let you take it over and thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Joan. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, nice and clear. <clears throat> and yes, so I'm going to uh, briefly talk about the legislation approach to controlling Legionnaires disease in England um, rather than the UK, although the legislation in the UK is all very, very, very much the same. Um, since devolution, there are some slight differences between the various countries, Scotland, Wales, and England and Northern Ireland, <coughs> in their laws. And so I'm going to be sp speaking specifically about um, the laws as they are currently in relation to England. Um, having said that, the, overall, the, UK, the approach in the UK to controlling Legionella is very much I think the same as it is elsewhere that is a, a preventative strategy um, with control based on our current knowledge of the ecology not just of Legionella itself but also the supporting microflora and that combined with good management practice and this is enshrined as you'll see in UK law now uh, when I first started working on Legionella around about 1980, there were two pages of Legionella specific guidance, which were produced by the Department of Health in response to a couple of hospital outbreaks in Oxford and Kingston in specific, specifically. But as you can just I've summarize on this slide, there's been a massive increase in the amount of guidance available since then. In the next decade, up until about uh, 1990, we went up to about 25 pages or thereabouts. In the next decade, we saw um, up to nearly 250 pages, or over 250 pages, in fact, <coughs> which is more or less where we are today. So briefly, if we look at the evolution of Legionella specific guidance in England since uh, <coughs> Uh, 1974. Now that predates the first recognition of Legion Dance disease, but it's significant because that was when we had a new act, the Health and Safety at Work Act, which replaced the old um, <coughs> Factories Act. And it covers all hazards, chemical, biological, physical, and radiological. And as we'll see later on, um, virtually everything to do with Legionnaire's disease or the laws associated with the regulations come under that, that act. So the first guidance note was, as I said, produced by the Department of Health in 1980. Uh, <clears throat> but as with many other countries, we had our wake up call in, in Britain as a result of the very large outbreak of Legionnaire's disease at Stafford General Hospital in 1985, which was very exciting for those of us doing the investigation, uh, led to a public inquiry, and that's quite an experience, uh, giving evidence to a public inquiry. And the initial response was, was an extra notice from the Department of Health, uh, HN86, 
giving extra engineering guidance uh, related to cooling towers and evaporative condensers because of our observations in relation to that outbreak. That was followed by the first outbreak, as <coughs> the first um, report of the public inquiry, and then following that, the Health and Safety Executive produced its first guidance note, EH48. Now, and over the next few years, there was concern that people were not interpreting the existing laws and regulations appropriately in relation to the control of Legionella. And so in 1991, the Health and Safety Commission, which was then uh, the governing body over the HSE, but is now, it's now all incorporated into the HSE, they produced the approved code of practice on the prevention of Legionellosis. So that's the first specific Legionella um, document with any real legal status. As you can see, uh, over the next few years, we got, we got new guidance and <coughs> new additions of the code of practice. And then in 2000, there was a big change in that the code of practice, which interprets, it tells you how to comply with the law and the guidance, the technical guidance, were all combined in this one big document, which was still referred to as L8. And now has, as you'll see, recently been changed again. And then in 2006, we had the HSE and HPA publication on the management of spa pools, that's spa pools or um, hot tubs, and uh, it's commonly known as jacuzzis to many of us. So in, some, in, in the UK, as in many other countries, there's layers of legislation and guidance. There's an act of parliament, which is the law and must be followed. And then there are regulations which interpret some of those um, <clears throat> clauses in the Act of Parliament, and they also have legal status must be um, obeyed. Under that, you have sometimes have approved codes of practice which tell you uh, how managerially to comply with the law. And then below that uh, are, is pure technical guidance and we'll see how this affects or rather how the, what apply, which regulations and acts of parliament apply to Legionnaires disease. So as I said, the Health and Safety at Work Act was written in 1974, obviously predates Legionella and doesn't specifically mention Legionella, but its duties extend to risks from Legionella. And in particular, the, the sections that people are most likely to get prosecuted under Section 2, which requires employees and non-employers, <coughs> uh, self-employed people, to ensure health and safety of employees. And Section 3, which requires them to ensure health and safety of non-employees, so far as reasonably practicable. And then Section 6 also requires substances and articles supplied for use at work to be safe, which is also um, interpreted in the regulation we'll see in a moment. The term reasonable practic practicality or practic practicability involves taking proportions proportionate to the risk. Now, this uh, term or similar terms occur in much UK legislation and um, has caused us some problems in recent years. Um, the European community uh, took the UK to uh, task in the European court, uh, saying that this uh, was a let out from the health and safety legislation, which the Europeans had then published a directive on health and safety, which very much follows our health and safety at work act, in fact. Um, but they thought that that clause meant that people wouldn't necessarily uh, apply appropriate precautions. I'm glad to say that the UK actually won their case in the European court and uh, the law has remained the same, and the terminology has remained the same. So the degree of risk in a particular job or workplace needs to be balanced against the time, trouble, etc., taking measures to avoid that risk. This is not a let out clause, um, <clears throat> but if there's uh, 
the risk is insignificant and the cost is disproportionately large, then you don't need to take steps. But in the case of Legionnaire's disease, for example, the risks from cooling towers are significant and they can be deadly. And therefore the courts take the position that costly preventative measures are justified. So now briefly look at the regulations. Um, most of the regulations, again, don't specifically mention Legionnaire's disease or Legionella. But the Control of Substances Health um, Hazardous to Health regulations covers all uh, chemicals, radiologicals, and biological substances. <clears throat> so Legionella and other infectious organisms come under this general regulation. And the next couple of regulations you'll see have certain things in common. All right, there's a requirement uh, to protect your employees and non-employees. We've already seen that in the Health and Safety at Work Act, but a risk assessment is required. Where a risk is identified, if possible, that should be replaced by substituting something which has no risk. For example, you could replace a cooling tower, a wet cooling tower, with a dry system. Um, <clears throat> but if that's not possible or not practical, then exposure must be controlled in some way by using control measures and there must be appropriate systems of maintenance and examination of the equipment and the test equipment and the control measures such as automatic dosing equipment and so on. Adequate provision of information, instruction and training for employees and uh, health surveillance may also be incorporated for where appropriate. <coughs> There's the management of health and safety at work regulations, again, that don't specifically mention Legionella, but they're quite important from the point of view of management. Uh, and again, you'll see the second bullet point mentions risk assessment, assessment and the risk assessment must be written. And it's, well, where there's five or more employees and the advice generally is that even if you have um, <clears throat> fewer than five employees, it's still worthwhile having a written, written record. There should be effective planning, organization, control, monitoring, and review, particularly review, and there should be communication and so on. You can, if you don't have the appropriate competent help within your organization or knowledge, employ external competent help. That doesn't mean that you, the duty holder um, <clears throat> is divested of all of their responsibilities. They still need to be able to ensure that the people they employ are competent and doing their job properly. So they need some, some level of education themselves to do that. And there should be cooperation where there's more than one duty holder. Legionnaire's disease, maybe if it's, if it's uh, contracted in the workplace, uh, such as somebody working on cooling towers or hot and cold water systems and spa pools, may be reportable as uh, under the reporting of injuries, disease and dangerous occurrences regulations as a, a workplace accident. But Legionnaire's disease is also reportable, of course, uh, since, at least since 2010, under the health protection not notification regulations to the appropriate health authorities. Now we come to the first and only set of regulations which specifically mentions Legionella, and that is the notification of cooling towers and evaporative condensers regulations, which were introduced in 1992 in response to pressure from uh, environmental health departments, local government departments and public health individuals like myself involved in outbreak investigations. We often spent a lot of time looking for cooling towers and thought that if a register existed, it would save an enormous amount of time right at the beginning of an outbreak investigation when it's very critical to examine the potential sources as rapidly as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the local authority holds the register and they need to be informed when their towers are going to be constructed, when they're, when they're put in operation, and also when they're taken out of operation. Now in our experience, um, particularly in the last decade or so, compliance with this 
regulation is really quite good. Way over 90% of towers are usually um, registered <clears throat> when we do an investigation. The biggest failure in compliance is usually um, with people failing to report when towers have been taken out of service, which can be an inconvenience. But generally, it has certainly assisted us in outbreak investigations. So then underneath the regulations, we have code of practice. We have a specific one for Legionella, as we see it burnt, and technical guidance of which we have quite a quantity. So the current situation now in 2018 is that we have a, an approved code of practice, um, <clears throat> which as I said before, has special legal status. And associated with that are four technical guidance documents, HSG 274 parts one, two, and three, relating to the control of Legionella in cooling systems on the first, hot and cold water systems, part two, control of lesionary bacteria in uh, other systems, that's sprinkler systems uh, and so on. And <clears throat> in 2017, the HSE guidance, HSG 282, the control of Legionella bacteria and other infectious agents. This is the first one that specifically mentions other infectious agents in spa pool systems. So let's have a little look at these Legionella-specific documents in a little more detail. So the Code of Practice provides advice to the managers on complying with the Health and Safety at Work Act and the COSH regulations and the regulations under that Act. You can use alternative methods to those set out in the Code of Practice and also in the technical guidance in order to comply with the law, but if you do so, you must be able to show that they are effective. The code of practice has a special legal status. If you don't follow it, you must show that the law has been complied with in some other way. And in reality, most people do comply with it. It applies to all plant and systems containing water that's likely to exceed 20 degrees Celsius where there is a means of creating and transmitting water droplets or generating an aerosol, which is likely to be inhaled and thereby causing reasonable for foreseeable risk of exposure to Legionella bacteria. So it includes cooling towers, evaporative condensers, hot and cold water services, humidifiers, air washers, tunnel washers in industry, spa pools, agricultural misting systems, and so on. It emphasizes that systems that are normally closed and operation, therefore not considered to be, a sit, to, to be a risk, can still present a risk when opened for maintenance. And it applies to all types of premises, shops, offices, factories, hospitals, industrial plant, agricultural establishments, entertainment facilities, etc. The only real exclusion are privately owned and occupied residences. So if you own your own house, then you don't have to comply with the law. But if it's a rented property, the landlord has to comply with the law. And L8 specifies a series of steps that are necessary to control the risk. There has to be somebody appointed who's managerially responsible. Uh, there has to be a risk assessment process to identify and assess the source of the risk and this needs to be written as we've seen if there's more than five employees. If you can't eliminate the risk <clears throat> by substitution then there has to be a written scheme for preventing and controlling the risk and that has to include up-to-date schematic diagrams uh, to enable people to rapidly identify key parts of systems. There needs, needs to be consultation with employees to on the risks and control measures. And most important of all, there needs to be a good management system with uh, good lines of communication uh, <clears throat> to mon and monitoring of all the appropriate precautions. Everything needs to be recorded and the records of the monitoring tests, whatever they might be, measuring temperature, 
biocide concentrations, pH and so on, must be kept for at least five years. The written risk assessment, when it's replaced by a new written risk assessment, also has to be kept for at least two years. <clears throat> and everything should be auditable and you should be able to follow an audit trail by um, documents being appropriately signed. So the risk assessment is, it should be a living document. Um, it used to be that we said it had to be reviewed and revised every two years. That specification has now gone. In, although in practice, if you look at the reasons for reviewing the risk assessment, on large buildings and large industrial premises and so on, it's very likely that a risk assessment will have to be uh, reviewed at least that frequently. So situations when the risk assessment might need re reviewing include changes to the water system or how it's used, change in the building use, uh, <clears throat> changes in the building itself, uh, new information that comes to light on the control measures that you use and from research um, or new control measures that might become available. Or new information on the risk if it's shown that a previously perceived risk is no longer a, a risk or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> if the monitoring checks carried out show that control measures are no longer working appropriately. Um, if there's changes to key personnel, in particular the, uh, the responsible person or the management above that or any key individuals in, in the management of the control measures. And of course, if there's a case of Legionnaire, Legionnaire's disease or other Legionellosis associated with the system. In addition to the risk assessment, the management communication procedures also need to be regularly reviewed to ensure they are kept up to date. There's a requirement that there should be an up-to-date schematic plan identifying key components in the system. Furthermore, uh, training and the importance of training and competence and ongoing training um, are emphasized and the new LA has extended the information on the responsibilities of designers, manufacturers, importers, suppliers and installers so that systems need to be designed so that they are constructed in a way that will hopefully inhibit the growth of Legionnaire and they need to be provided with appropriate up-to-date information and instructions that need to be updated when appropriate as well. And the suppliers of products and services such as water treatment specialists need to ensure that their measures are designed and implemented so that they're effective and safe and they can show that they're effective. Uh, and they need to provide adequate information to the user in those respects as well. <clears throat> Finally, there's a requirement that you should have a, a written scheme of action in the event of an outbreak, how you're going to go about uh, using your cooling towers or your water system and so on. Now in healthcare establishments, there's a slightly different set of um, regulations and, and uh, Government, um, Acts of Parliament, the ones we've already spoken about are still, uh, still apply, the Health and Safety Work Act and all the HSE documents. But in addition to that, uh, in 2008, the Care Quality Commission was created by the Health and Social Care Act. And this body is responsible for um, managing all healthcare buildings in the NHS, not buildings, so all healthcare um, organizations like hospitals, GP surgeries, nursing homes, and so on. And underneath that healthcare, health, health and social care act, there are some sets of regulations again. Uh, <clears throat> and Finally, there, and specifically, there's the Health and Social Care Act 2008 Code of Practice on the Prevention and Control of Infections and Related Guidance, uh, which is particularly important, again, in relation to Legionnaire's disease and other 
uh, potential uh, waterborne pathogens within hospital environments. And then there's also uh, some very, again, detailed health technical guidance called Health Technical Memoranda, and the 0401 on, is entitled Safe Water in Healthcare Premises in three parts, covering the design, installation and commissioning, operation and management, which includes um, details of testing for Legionella and other microorganisms, and also part C, which is specific for Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, in augmented care units. So the Health and Safety Care Act Code of Practice on Prevention of Infections applies to all registered providers of healthcare. So as I say, hospitals, GP surgeries, nursing homes, and so on. And it includes managing water safety, um, including Legionella, Legionella, but also other waterborne pathogens. There's a set of criteria against which the Care Quality Commission judge people, and the, those who wish to be registered need to ensure they follow those same criteria. <clears throat> so, and by following the code of practice, uh, registered providers will be able to show they meet the requirements of the regulations, and they must continue to do so. Now, the Health Technical Memoranda, the latest version, 2016, uh, it's a development on the previous guidance. It's moving users uh, towards um, the holistic management of water systems, i.e. the water safety plan approach and water safety groups. Um, water safety plan approach as originally uh, <clears throat> the terminology originally applied by WHO. Uh, it provides comprehensive advice and guidance to all those involved in healthcare, management, design engineers, and so on. And in addition, it's got some information now on uh, climate change, and the need for adaption and mitigation of measures uh, in response to climate change. It doesn't just apply to Legionella, it also applies to Aeruginosa and Stenotrophomonas multifilia, mycobacteria, and others. Um, <clears throat> it's in line with L8 and HSG274 guidance. So that's the HSE's document. It's also in line with the Healthcare uh, Prevention and Infection Code of Practice and appropriate regulations. <clears throat> it gives um, a lot more information now on uh, the formation of writing water safety plans and the formation of water safety group who will manage the water safety plans and manage water safety in healthcare environments. It's emphasized the importance of competency, competency and the training of not just the people responsible for uh, overall management, but also plumbers and installers themselves. Um, <clears throat> Something that's been in the water industry for a long time, but hasn't always been the case in hospitals. Uh, emphasizing safe hygiene practices associated with the use of water uh, equipment that uses water and detailed sampling for testing. So all of these guidance documents essentially follow the same control principles, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, if possible, eliminate the source of the risk. As I said before, substituting a dry cooling system for a wet cooling system, for example, would be uh, one possibility. Avoiding the water temperatures that might support growth of Legionella, specifically, particularly 20 to 45 degrees Celsius. Um, and where there is a risk, inhibiting growth either physically by temperature for management, for example, or chemically by the use of biocides and so on. Systems need to be designed and operated so you can keep them clean, prevent dirt getting into the system, keep them closed as much as possible, and they need to be flushed and disinfected after construction, immediately before occupation that is, and also before and after modification or repair. 
and systems should be designed and constructed so that they're easy to clean and disinfect. So there must be ease of access to the appropriate bits and pieces, easy, easy to make, to remove equipment, to service it and to dismantle it as appropriate. Um, as with all systems that use potable water, the materials that are used in uh, construction of Legionella prone systems should wherever possible be tested so that uh, we know that they don't support significant microbial growth. Keeping the waters moving, keep it flowing, control aerosolization as much as possible and limit dispersal. So for example, on cooling towers, you would have drift eliminators. Uh, as I say, keeping the system clean, uh, remove dirt and biofilm regularly, again, particularly in cooling towers, preferably combining physical or chemical removal with chemical disinfection. And the new HSG 274 part one, uh, which relates to cooling towers and evaporative condensers gives uh, uh, excellent sets of pictures of cooling tower pack to uh, try and explain what a clean cooling tower pack should look like. Um, and similarly for the hot and cold water systems, there are pictures of the insides of tanks. Um, again, indicating how clean a tank should appear for the purposes of uh, the Legionnaire guidance. In healthcare environments, particularly, you need to identify high risk areas. That is not so much areas of the water system, but um, the population that's exposed to that water system. And obviously it has to be continuous maintenance and monitoring to ensure the safe operation of the system continues, as we said before, with training of staff. Now, both the HSE document relating to hot and cold water systems, that's HSG 274 part two, and the Department of Health, Health Technical Memoranda advise uh, the water safety plan approach um, <clears throat> first described by WHO, I guess, in healthcare premises, and such as um, WHO describes in the guidelines for safe drinking water. Um, most hospitals and healthcare premises should have a water safety group rather than an individual who's, has, which has collective responsibility for managing the risk in the water systems. That group will generally include representatives of the infection and prevention control staff, uh, nursing care, um, engineers, one or more engineers who are familiar with the water systems and the cooling systems and so on, um, <clears throat> a health and safety representative, a uh, member of the executive management team, uh, probably a specialist water advisor, and possibly representatives from specialist users like hydrotherapy or decontamination, dialysis, etc. So that's all I want to talk about the regulations and, and as they are existing currently. And now I want to move on to microbiological monitoring, which is one of the questions we are asked to address. Um, in, the UK, in the UK, in, in uh, the HSE documents, cooling towers are recommended to be tested quarterly for Legionella. And the target is they should have less than 100 CFU per litre. That's effectively the detection limit for most laboratories when using culture. And um, also a TVC or heterotrophic aerobic count is 48 degrees, sorry, 40, for, uh, 38, 30 degrees Celsius for 48 hours incubation. And that's commonly done by a dip slide. Although as a microbiologist, I don't particularly like dip slides. And there the target is there should be less than uh, 10,000 per mil. Hot and cold water systems, Legionella is not required, uh, but it is recommended if there's any doubt about the efficacy of your control regime. So if you know there's a failure in your temperature or biocide control, then <clears throat> initially 
you'll be testing weekly and gradually over time that frequency of testing will be reduced um, well, as you gain confidence that the system is under control. Similarly, where biocides are used as the primary control um, and not water temperatures, <coughs> and water temperature is likely to support growth. So if you deliberately keep your hot water system at 40 to 45 degrees Celsius, for example, which will be the highest risk for uh, generating Legionella, uh, then uh, you would certainly initially test monthly and you might, you might over time gradually reduce that frequency of testing. In hospitals, particularly where there are populations at a high risk of infection, then monitoring may well be justified. And obviously, again, if there are cases of lesions associated with the premises, then testing will be undertaken. This um, is a table taken from HSG 274 part two in relation to hot and cold water systems. And here you can see it just gives you some advice about um, what actions should be taken. I, I personally um, don't really like this. I don't think it's specific enough. And what does the minority of samples mean? What does the majority of samples mean? It doesn't tell you how many samples to take or what proportion we're talking about there. And there's, we try to get that change in the revision of the this latest revision, but it's still being left in, in that sort of vague manner. If you get relatively high numbers, then immediately there should be some action taken. And that also applies to the TVC and cooling towers. If uh, you've got over a million per mil, then some action is supposed to be taken straight away. In healthcare establishments, um, again, in areas where patients are at increased risk, sampling is commonly undertaken. I, I think, strictly speaking, it's possibly not required by the law, uh, but in practice is generally undertaken, and the Air Quality Commission will take a pretty dim view of establishments that don't do some Legionella testing and certainly pseudomonas erosionosa testing in the appropriate parts of the building. And part B of the Health Technical Memorandum includes very comprehensive guidance on the interpretation of Legionella sampling results uh, and including when using pre and post flush samples. It's a very complicated set of um, figures which I did think about putting up, but I think you wouldn't be able to read them anyway. But you, these documents are all freely available for, over the internet if anybody wants to look at them. The uh, guidance for spa pools, uh, slightly easier to illustrate on the slide, um, pH and chlorine measurements should be made at least twice a day in hot tubs which are used for business. That's for example, um, if you rent chalets out, holiday chalets and each one has a hot tub, then they should be tested at least daily. Uh, and depending on the risk assessment and degree of usage that might be increased to three or more times a day. In commercial spa pools, so large leisure complexes, um, these are pools with um, overflow, <coughs> deck level overflow and balanced tanks, then they should be tested like swimming pools on opening and then every two hours throughout the day. And microbiological testing, um, colony count E. coli and pseudomonas originosa on a monthly basis and quarterly Legionella in the same way as cooling towers. So enforcement, who are the enforcing agencies? Well, the Health and Safety at Work Act and the associated guidance regulations are enforced by two bodies in England, well, in, in the whole of the UK. That is the Health and Safety Executive Inspectors, and they will enforce in manufacturing establishments generally, heavy industries, hospitals. Uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately, you know, a reflection on the um, shortage of um, funds these days, generally there's no preventative inspections undertaken or very few preventative inspections undertaken these days. It's a complete contrast to when I was uh, a young microbiologist, some 
30 years ago, the health and safety inspectors regularly went round factories, um, <clears throat> amongst other things, looking at Legionella precautions. And the other group is the local government environmental health officers, and they are responsible for enforcing the Health and Safety at Work Act in offices, hotels, retail establishments, leisure facilities, and so on. Um, <clears throat> if uh, there are local government owned premises, then the HSE wouldn't, would be the enforcing body for those. And now, following the 2008 Act and the creation of the Care Quality Commission, they also have powers of both inspection and prosecution, not so much under the Health and Safety at Work Act, but under the appropriate um, healthcare acts and they do unlike local government and health and safety inspectors they do carry out regular inspections uh, as part of the registration process and now in uk common law is based on precedents and there's one very well-known case which is very significant to the interpretation of uh, the Health and Safety at Work Act in and relation to Legionnaires disease in particular um, <clears throat> in, in England and Wales, sorry, in UK. There was an appeal, uh, there was an outbreak of Legionnaires disease in um, around about 1991, as I recollect now, uh, in London, in, in Kensington. And the Science Museum was uh, prosecuted and uh, they were found guilty. They didn't cause the outbreak. There was no evidence that they had caused the outbreak, but they didn't have adequate precautions in place on their cooling systems, which were um, clearly at risk of being contaminated with Legionella and managed in a way that would allow Legionella to grow in them. They appealed because they said lesion hadn't been found in them, there was no link to the outbreak. And the appeal was dismissed. And the judgment said it was sufficient for the prosecution to prove that the public were exposed to the possibility of danger, that the risk that harmful bacteria might emerge outside the appellant building and had exposed the public to a possibility of danger. And the jury were entitled to conclude, as they had done, that they hadn't taken all practical steps to minimize the risk. So how effective is this legislation and guidance? Well, unfortunately, it's very difficult to measure the effectiveness against the background of improving ascertainment of cases. Uh, in the UK, just as in much of the rest of the world, we've seen an increase in the number of cases in the last uh, decade or two, uh, particularly since the introduction of urinary antigen tests. Um, so some of this is probably due to under ascertainment previously, and then there may well be some real increase in the, in the instance of cases. Um, in the early 80s, when I first started working on Legionnaires disease, the Department of Health was funding a very large investigation of the incidence of Legionella in hospitals and, and other buildings and, and cruise liners for that matter. We got a lot of interesting information, so much of which has never been published. Um, and in my latter years in the Health Protection Agency, we tried to get funding to repeat that work to establish whether there'd been any significant change in colonization of buildings or the numbers of Legionella that were detected. Um, we are never most successful in persuading people to give us the money to do that. It was a very, a very expensive survey initially and wouldn't have been much different, I guess, now. It would be quite expensive to undertake. And with the improvement in laboratory techniques, it might have been resist, uh, difficult to interpret some of the results. But my personal feeling is that the proportion of buildings that have Legionella in them has probably not changed dramatically, but the actual numbers that are detected uh, will be appreciably lower, and also the frequency of the detection around the building. 
there's certainly it's not, it's not possible to see any effect on the numbers of cases over the years. Um, no water system, however, that has been shown to be the cause of an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease uh, has failed. Sorry, I started the wrong way around. No water system that's uh, managed and operated following the managerial and technical guidance in, in L8 and the HHG 274, 282 and the HGMs has ever been implicated or shown to be a source of Legionnaire's disease. If that's saying anything, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but certainly in every outbreak investigation where we've identified, identified a possible source of Legionnaire's disease or definitely identified it, then there have been significant failings in compliance with the law and the guidance. Um, there was concern that the fines um, in health and safety cases were not reflecting the severity of the offences. And as a consequence, in February 2016, there were new sentencing guidelines produced. And the principal focus of that was to ensure that fines are sufficiently substantial to have a real economic impact, which will bring home to both management and shareholders the need to comply with health and safety legislation. And the fines are based on the company turnover, and they may be as much as 10 to 40% of the annual turnover. Potentially huge. International companies, the international turnover uh, would be considered. And we have seen um, quite a dramatic rise in the last few years, and it will continue because this will only apply to cases since. 1st of February 2016. So a lot of the cases coming to court now predate that by a long way. Um, but for example, there was a store in, uh, that sold a hot tub and infected a uh, number of people. The hot tub was on display, sorry. And uh, the store there was fined a million pounds and there have been several other instances of uh, cases in the last year or two where fines have been in the millions. <clears throat> So whether this will have a, a great effect on the or greater effect on the application of uh, the health and safety law remains to be seen. So thank you for listening to me. I hope you've uh, gained some benefit from from my discussion and I'm free now to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we'll have the committee um, go ahead and ask you some questions. Start with Chuck Hoff. Yeah, um, so I've now heard in your presentation, but I've heard in the previous several, you used the phrase risk assessment. And I wonder if there's any specific guidance as to what that constitutes. What, what the risk assessment? What well, is a risk yes. assessment or what constitutes a risk? What constitutes a risk assessment? Um, <clears throat> well, there's a, there's a, it's explained in um, the HGM document, sorry, in, in the HSG documents, and there's a okay. British standard for risk assessment, as BS 8580, um, which also outlines the process and where, how you go about the process, what you consider. So you consider, um, as I said before, if the system uses water, what's the temperature of the water? What temperature is it likely to get to? Uh, is there stagnation of the water anywhere? Um, is the water likely to be aerosolized? So in a hot water system, obviously in the cold water system, there's potential for aerosolization at the outlets, showers, <coughs> taps, and so on. Um, what measures are in place to control the risk, the existing measures, um, whether those are adequate. You'd look at, uh, mostly, most of the time these days we're looking at an assessment, a risk assessment of an ex a system which has already been risk assessed in the past and has already got control measures in place. So in a, a hotel or a hospital, for example, you'd look at whether the sampling points for measuring temperature 
and maybe biocide measurements and possibly Legionella or, or other microbiological sampling were in the appropriate place. Um, were they representative of, of the highest risk in that system? Um, and if not, then uh, they, they should be and there should be recommendations to change them. Um, so it says, <laughs> I'm not sure that answers your question, but I say there are certainly it's, there's a documents several pages long explaining the risk assessment process. Um, no, no, with, it, with the water safety God. plan in a hospital, now you'd look at where the source of water is, whether it's so if there's a private water supply as well as the public water supply, that might imply have implications. Um, whether there's intermediate storage tanks and so on. So, John, is it, is it the HTML 401 That's correct. document that has, that has the, okay, thank you. And, and the HSG document as well. There's a key, there's a table in, uh, in the back of the um, HSG document, which uh, lists the things you should be looking at in a risk review or a risk assessment. And I say there's okay, a that's the 274, HSG 274. Yes, yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, Steve, here we go. So, um, just a question about the levels that you've given. Since we've heard from a couple different groups about um, risk levels in terms of detection of Legionella. Um, where it's greater than 100 seems to be the threshold for detection as one. But the other is, I think it was greater than that. With a thousand, I think is what it was. Um, do you have a sense with that based on data, or is that sort of a um, a decision that sort of uh, from others? Is it uh, where, where does that where does the, the cutoffs come from that you guys have used? Well, in in I should I should emphasize. I think I I didn't say that that uh, testing for Legionella is not essential for hot and cold water systems. Uh, the essential things are monitoring temperature or biocide levels where they're applied. Um, and in cooling towers, it's, it will be monitoring your biocide levels. Uh, the pH, uh, TVCs are monitored as well. Um, the general operation of the system, uh, the operation of the biocide dosing. So the microbiological monitoring is only as the final sort of validation. Now the levels, uh, yes, there was a lot of debate about the levels. And in hot and cold water systems, when we've examined those in uh, following outbreaks, we've quite often only seen relatively low numbers. And the important thing is often not so much the actual numbers, but the frequency with which you get isolation. So you in a hospital you might find that one area a couple of wards have a high frequency of positives and um, these will be counts of hundreds or maybe thousands but re really above a, th a thousand or ten thousand in hot and cold water systems so a thousand was considered to be uh, an, an alarm bell that's you you wouldn't really want to consistently have those sort of levels in systems because you know that the numbers can actually go up very abruptly overnight to from thousands to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Personally, the highest numbers I've ever seen in a hot and cold water system uh, are in toilet systems in tropical countries where we've seen hundreds of thousands of Legionella pneumophila pellita. In contrast, in cooling towers, uh, then in if you look at the data from outbreak investigations on those few occasions when we've actually got to a cooling tower while it's definitely still been infecting people, then the counts have always been above 10 to the 5, usually almost with, with one exception, actually, they're always above a million per litre. And so, <clears throat> again, the time to go from 10 to the 4 per litre to a million per litre can be relatively short in nature, so we set a, um, a maximum level that will require immediate action 
at a relatively low, low, what might be considered by some to be a relatively low level. In the uh, European guidelines, we did, when we first wrote the European guidelines, which were very much based on the UK guidelines, um, we did actually relax the action level for cooling towers. But, um, in the current guidelines, they've been brought in line with the UK. I'm not sure that really answers your question, but <laughs> I think it's based on experience. There's not there's not lots of published data, apart from say a few outbreak investigations. Okay, so um, we're running a little bit short on time, so we'll take a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Ruth, then we'll go to Michelle, then we'll go to Nick. Okay, thank you, John. This is um, about two questions. One, do you have any codes or laws that the public water supply. Now, the public, public water supply, I mean, there are drinking water regulations. They do not specify testing for Legionella currently. There are also regulations on the design and, and construction of hot and cold water systems. Uh, they are designed very much to prevent microbial growth and to prevent microbial contamination of systems. So they would in part cover Legionella, but they don't specify Legionella, um, although they do take Legionella into consideration when you're talking about hot water temperatures. Uh, but the Europe, the current, the European Drinking Water Directive is currently up for revision and there is a suggestion that Legionella should be included in that. Although we are leaving Europe, well, I'm told we are, uh, <laughs> we will continue to <laughs> the European Drinking Water Directive, I'm, as far as I understand. Uh, so I guess we'd introduce Legionella testing if that was agreed. Um, I'm not sure personally in a cool climate whether there's a lot of value in testing uh, main supplies for Legionella. They very rarely find them by culture. You can by PCR. Um, but as you get into warmer climates, or certainly if the water temperature increases, then that may well be worth investigating. I, again, I've investigated outbreaks in the West Indies where the incoming town supply had thousands of Legionella per litre in it. And my second question is, is there any evidence that use of urine antigen testing has increased in the past 10 years? Any evidence that the use of urine antigen testing, did you say? Yeah, for clinical, um, yeah, for in clinical use. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's been widely used in the UK now for, for some time, yeah. And in fact, we always, the reference laboratory for decades has had a urinary antigen test, which they use as a, as a confirmation. But now, of course, there's, there's, there's bedside tests available, which are used, widely used. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah. Um and I have a, a detailed question for you, John. I, you covered such wide uh, regulations and all topics. Um, one of the things that I think the UK is, is very um, progressive about is the uh, um, addressing the issue of TMVs or mixing valves and dead ends. Um, I think you have probably the most uh, detailed uh, um, technical guidance on on, on whether or not to install them, and if you do, and they become contaminated. I was remembering uh, in your HTM 0401, I think it's the, the second or third one of that serial one, yeah, page 59, it shows the importance if, if it's a TMV and the device is contaminated, what you have to do. And so would you, would you comment in general on where you are in the UK and in installing these devices for scalp prevention, is it still a question of risk um, balancing or is it like you want to get away from it if you can or, or are you installing them for scalp protection all over the place still? Right, so there, there was a big move to install TMVs and there was a big, well, I know, both in the States and, and in in the UK and probably elsewhere in Europe as well, of course, there was a, uh, a big campaign to uh, anti-scolding campaign at one time. 
And I think this caused too large a swing to, uh, in, to the installation of TMVs. And of course, once you install a TMV, you've got no control from that point down uh, on the, no temperature control anyway, uh, to no. enable you to prevent Legionella growing in there. And we, and we did see an increase in the instance of Legionella in hospitals because of that. <clears throat> the, yeah, the ten trend now is moving away from installing TMVs wherever uh, possible, uh, but still installing them where there is a risk of a severe risk of people being installed. So, oh, sorry, being scolded. So, in um, intensive care units, for example, the patients are not going to be washing their hands. Uh, <laughs> there's not really any logical reason for having TMVs um, there. Uh, <laughs> Shower, there will be a limited number of showers in, in those premises as well. So where there's, where there's total body immersion, yes, you should have some protection. Uh, <clears throat> but wherever possible, uh, we would, I would discourage fail-safe TMVs. Thank you, John. Nick? Hey, just to follow up on this, would it be possible? Maybe Michelle, um, we're running out of, Michelle, we're running out of time. So I think we'll have to follow up uh, via email. Okay, thank you. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And Nick? John, in relation to action levels, I was wondering if you've had an update from your 2011 publication on the value of QPTR versus culture. Uh, and in that paper, as you know, you, you focused on artificially contaminated waters. Uh, have you moved on to evaluating that in real scenarios? And, and what's the uptake for QPTR? Um, well, we. <laughs> We did publish a paper where we looked at naturally contaminated systems, um, but there's, oh, the HSE has certainly had a, um, a group looking at rapid methods. Uh, they haven't produced a report yet. <laughs> um, that's working in conjunction with Public Health England and the Water Management Society. Uh, there hasn't been a big uptake of PCR to be fair, uh, because of the problems of interpretation, I think people are, are afraid of um, using PCR because they know they get lots of positives and then they don't know how to interpret them. Um, I think we could write guidance which would enable people to interpret it properly. If you've got a system which is under control and you're not getting culture positives, but you're still getting significant PCR positives, then you've got a system which is got Legionella feeding into it from somewhere and you can trace that source by using PCR but it's not I said that's not widely applied at the moment and there's no real written guidance uh, that's been accepted at the moment in, in the in the UK having said that there are, are more specific PCRs looking for um, serial group one specifically and also looking for those strains which have the uh, particularly pathogenicity markers we're interested in and they have been used in outbreak investigation <coughs> with success but not currently being used for routine monitoring thank you okay thank you so much we're going to follow up probably with some emails um on some of the reports that you mentioned and okay. papers i think we'd be particularly interested in your if you have documented data on um, the increase in Legionella cases after the TMV installations in hospitals before well, and after. Cases, it's increased. Yeah, we, we have a very low instance of hospital acquired cases in the UK. We're less than the European average, significantly less. Um, so it's diff that certainly you've got no statistics on the basis of cases because there aren't sufficient cases to get any significant data. What I was talking so the, about. So you meant occurrence then? When you said that, you meant occurrence and environmental samples. I, I meant occurrence and, and environmental samples. That's correct. Yes. Oh, okay. That that would be of interest to us as well. So we'll follow up. We have some other questions and some of these reports, and um, you threw a lot of information at us. So we're going to look through your your emails and get back or your PowerPoint and get back to you. We really appreciate your time. There's. Uh, I've put the web links into the, a lot of the documents in there, so you can get the significant documents. From I saw that. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.